up guys? Welcome back to Trouble Hands. Welcome to the fifth and final episode where this week we're going to be talking about the hands King-10 offsuit, King-Jack offsuit, shit like that. Um, these are hands which are frequently getting beginning players into trouble because they are often dominated, as you can tell, by Ace-Jack, Ace-King, King-Queen, all these sort of hands. And they're the sort of hands that in some situations end up either winning small pots or they lose big ones especially against tight ranges because people tend not to play many offsuit hands or even that many suited hands for that matter that are dominated by these but they do however play a lot of combinations of hands that dominate these hands so this video is going to focus all around like how to play these pre-flop whether we can flat them against opening ranges whether we can decide that we might want to turn them into a bluff by 3-betting them because they've got good blockers and they play okay um, versus someone who folds a lot of 3-bets for instance and how we can avoid uh, playing them in the sort of situations that are going to get you into heaps of trouble post-flop so this this piece of artwork here is basically I think it's pretty exemplary of the common problems with King Jack offsuit basically it thinks it's a lot bigger and cooler than it is. I mean, look at the glasses on these guys. They think they're some sort of mafia dudes, like golden teeth. But really, all the king's got is like this sort of battered old club with a few spikes in it. And the jack's got, in case you can't tell from like my wonderful artwork, the jack has a plank of horrible old wood with some nails through it, which would actually like give you tetanus if he smacked you across the face for that. It would not be pleasant, right? I'm not saying it would be nice to be hit with that, but as you've seen in previous videos, a lot of our monsters had far superior weapons to this. You know, we had the guns, we had like the big spears and stuff, so these guys are, they're hot shots basically. They're like the little playground bullies. You know, the guys that traumatize the little guys, but as soon as someone stands up to them, they just run. You know, that's what I mean by that. They're dominated hands, they're, they might look pretty because they're two Broadway cards, they might think they're awesome, but they're really not as cool as they think they are and as a lot of new players think they are. So I've got five hands to talk about today so we're gonna go into detail on those try and detect the common mistakes and yeah um, next week or whenever my next video comes out probably be at the start of the start of January you'll be watching this probably around the 20 something of December so at the start of January another video another series will come out for me as this is the last one from from Trouble Hands for this current series. In the next series, I'm probably going to do what's known as a member session review. And I'm going to do maybe three or four of these sessions. And what that means is, guys, I actually want you to PM me when you watch this video. I'm also going to put a post about this on the forums shortly. And what I'm looking for is sort of 20 minute to 30 minute, let's go for 30 minute videos of you guys, like four tabling your normal stakes. I want someone who's playing between 10 NL and 100 NL and I, 6 max obviously and what I'm gonna do is if you can upload a video of you playing like just playing no commentary no nothing just you playing your session I will actually go through it and review it as my next series and I will do a sort of member review thing so you're basically getting a free coaching session it won't be interactive because you're not going to be able to ask stuff throughout it and stuff like in a normal session review coaching session but you're going to be able to see me going through and basically finding all the leaks in your play and just like smashing the shit out of everything you're doing wrong which is hugely beneficial and you're getting this for free just for the normal cost of a grade of school subscription you can watch the video afterwards as can everyone else who can benefit from it as well so it's going to basically be a first come first serve basis I want you guys to PM me or email me with videos um, you might want to email me first just to reserve a place in this because I assume this should be quite popular because I'd imagine no one wants to miss out on this sort of opportunity to get this sort of thing for free. So I'm going to do probably, I'm going to say I'm going to do three for now. If I'm going to do any more than three I'll let you know. So the first three members to PM me who are regular six max grinders, I don't want any full ring guys just making a six max vid for the sake of it. You need to be a regular six max grinder playing somewhere between 10 no limit and 100 no limit. Okay. And the first three guys to PM me who are suitable for this, I'm going to approve to and say go ahead and make me a video and send it to me. And that's going to be the next series. So I'm quite excited about that. I think it should be pretty fun and should be very helpful for you guys. 
and also give you a flavour of what it's like um, to have a session of you in, during coaching. Obviously, it's less interactive, but it'll still be good. Okay, so let's get into the the King Jack, King Ten, Trouble Hands, hand histories now. Okay, so first hand is a hand I played at 200 NL the other day. I've been playing a lot more 200 recently. Um, pretty much solidly moved up now because I've I've made enough buy-ins for me to be happy to be grinding 200. So hopefully I'll be able to get some 200 NL videos out to you guys because I know there's not like a whole lot of a lot of stuff above 100 NL on the site, and that's the way it's aimed, obviously. So that's fine. But just for just because I think it'd be interesting, it might be quite cool. Um, just to see how higher games play, I'll maybe at some point in the future do like a 200 NL um video session review or live play or something like that. Um, because the games are there are a lot of the same regs here as you'll notice. I've got the same stats, a lot of hands on a lot of these guys because I play with them at hundreds as well. But you know the games certainly do run a little bit, a little bit tougher, a little bit sort of less fishy, more reggy. The usual sort of differences that you'd expect to see when you move up for between any level, really. So this might be a bit off for some of you guys, but um, like I say, I'll do I'll do some 200 stuff at some point in the future because I think it'd be quite cool. Okay, so the first hand we're in the hijack with King Jack offsuit. This is going to be like a standard open for me on pretty much any table. The only reason I wouldn't open a hand like this in the hijack is if I had loads of regs 3 betting the shit out of me in the cutoff and the button, um, even in the blinds. If I had guys just 3 betting me a lot, then this is the sort of hand that I can 4 bet bluff with it if I think that's good. But you know, 4 betting these days, it can be dodgy versus a lot of regs who are just expecting it. So it's not the sort of hand I can defend with against a 3 bet really, because it's just dominated and horrible. So it might be a candidate for tightening the hell up and folding, but only if there were. I probably wouldn't open this under the gun, um, and I would probably fold it in the hijack if I had reason to fold it, like a lot of guys 3 bet me. Here, this isn't too bad. Raiden enjoys a good 3 bet, but he's more like in position. He prefers to do it, the cut off and the button mainly. Um, we've got Fish here as well, he's going to flat a bunch of dominated stuff. Like I was saying at the start of the video, um, usually King Jack is the one, the hand that sort of takes the domination, but against a guy like this, it's going to be flat and like loads of like King 10, King 9 suited, King 6 suited, Jack 9 suited, all this crap. We are going to actually dominate his range more than he's going to dominate ours, which is good. So, if we're going to open King Jack here, pretty standard. Get called by Wally Malone in the cutoff. So, 1916, fairly tight regular. His range is probably mainly sort of pocket pairs, I'd say like deuces through to jacks or whatever. Anything he won't 3 bet, it doesn't have that high a 3 bet stat, 6.8%. Um, and then maybe some suited connectors, jack 10, queen jack suited. Stuff like that, maybe like ace jack, ace queen, king queen maybe. So we get a king 5 4 board, this is going to be a standard C bet, A to get value, B to balance with all the times we. See better air here. He's going to peel peeling this flop pretty wide wide here. He's going to be floating a lot in position. Um, I don't really have a hugely accurate number on his fold to see bet. It's only like twenty five percent. It's only going to be over four hands or so. So that's not like don't read too much into that. Those sort of stats over only two hundred hands. They never tell like the full story. But you know, it's an indication that he may be apt to float. We don't know. So the queen on the turn kind of mech card for us. I mean it scares a lot of his sort of ace five suited or his like pocket sevens might get folds from those now if we bet. Um the thing is though, this is a card that he is gonna expect us to barrel with like all of our air, so I don't think he's gonna fold like the better sort of pairs in his range here, like Jacks and Tens and stuff. Um if he has randomly floated with a queen or something with Ace Queen he's now not folding. If he just decided to float this flop with Ace Queen or whatever try and take it away, his combos of king-queen which is probably about the only king in his range because I'd expect him to 3 bet ace king and fold lesser kings have now been reduced drastically by that card falling on the turn so and that, already, that hand already was beating us anyway so it's actually not too bad a card for us we're going to bet here and expect to still be like easily plus 50% against his calling range on the turn which is obviously the criteria for making a successful value bet not always but that's like the first thing to consider and then you want to think about whether a it just even if I only had like forty percent here, it could still be that Ben was the best line, technically, because check folding or check calling might be worse than that, equity wise. So just something to think about. But generally, you want to think how's my equity versus continuing range here, and in this spot it's going to be fine. We can easily bet. We can bet um, a reasonable size here that we barrel with. I think twenty four is okay. Yeah. 
might make it a tad on the smaller side just to try and induce more calls from the sort of pocket eights and those sort of hands because they do make up a lot of his range at this point. He calls again, like I say, he's going to be expecting us to, to bet this turn a lot. Now on the river, this is a weird sort of spot and it's kind of close I think between... I I was actually playing this hand while Micro to Macro, who's a kind of school instructor or at least was, um, was sweating me and we discussed this river spot. and. Um, I think we agreed it was the sort of spot where it's a very thin sort of value bet because yeah we probably get called by like a random queen if he has one but he doesn't have a queen super often just because he'll fold the flop with ace queen a lot of time and queen jack and stuff he won't always float um, and he doesn't have any worse kings in his reign so really we're trying to get hero called here by like tens, jacks, nines and stuff but because this is one of these sort of spots where we're going to be playing this guy a lot, he's a 200 regular you know we are going to be playing against him a lot we do need to think about balance a little bit here just in that if we're not actually betting this king jack on this river for value you know like good luck bluffing here because we will, we are going to be three barreling this board quite a lot this is one of the flops one of the boards where we will three barrel because if he can call a turn with like eights, nines, tens, jacks, like even those 24 combos, that's going to make up a lot of his range here. So, because he has quite tight pre flop. So, if we can make him fold those on the river, then it is a spot where we're going to be three barreling quite a lot. So, I like a bet here, and I think it is close, like equity wise, I've called because he can have like king, queen still, although he would raise the turn sometimes. He can still have sets in his range. Um, and you could still have something like ace ace if he decided not to three bet that but generally I think a lot of his range still is like tens, jacks, nines, stuff like that here with the odd ace queen or something too so I think there's enough hands for us to potentially get hero called by given it's a spot that an aggro reg such as ourselves is going to be barreling quite a lot for three streets so and a lot of these concepts guys aren't going to be strictly relevant at your stake so please don't like take everything I'm saying and then apply it to totally different situations at 10 and L don't do that you know you don't need to worry so much about balancing these spots at 10 and L but in this sort of spot at 10 and L you're probably going to get looked up more often just by stationary players so it probably might still be a value bet depending on the, the opponent but like I say don't just take everything um objectively you know think about it subjectively in the moment and in the given hand against this player and the reads I've got on him okay and don't apply things that aren't relevant so back to this river spot then I think a bet here is fine we will get hero called sometimes it balances our range if he does look us up here with a better hand or even a worse hand it means that we can get away with three barrel and more rivers because he knows we're betting kind of thin for value if we're betting king jack here this is probably about you know if I'm betting king jack here if he doesn't have worse kings in his range technically I should be betting any king here because he doesn't have king 10 or king 9 it doesn't really matter too much so you know any king here is probably going to be a value bet for that reason partly for balance and partly because I don't think we're doing terrible I think we've got close to 50% equity here versus his calling range if not more so I think it is going to be a value bet I think the sizing is okay it's the sort of sizing that gives him an okay price but it can still quite easily be a bluff it's the sort of sizing we want to choose in that spot so I think that's fine Okay, so this one we're in a small blind. <clears throat> and NSD Zhang, who is kind of nitty, bad, losing regular. No offense if you're a grinder school member, pretty sure you're not because you spend all your days grinding and not learning by the looks of it. This guy's 1914, 28% ATS, button opening range 37%, tighter than some regs are going to be on the button. Um. I don't feel thrilled about flattening King Jack here. This is the sort of spot you need to watch out for. Yes, it will dominate like some of his range, but when you're out of position with no initiative, you actually need quite a large equity edge, either by dominating his range or just doing really well against his range, to continue here unless you have a huge skill edge on your opponent. Because NSD Zhang gives up a lot post-flop, you only see about 47%. I probably could flat here and it wouldn't be terrible, but be wary about these sort of spots, about flattening these hands that will be dominated some of the time and don't have a big enough equity edge over your opponent's opening range to compensate for the fact that you're out of position with no initiative and there's a potential squeezer in the big blind, someone that can squeeze, not someone that, I don't mean someone that's likely to squeeze by potential, I just mean you can get squeezed sometimes, so you're not actually getting to the flop 100% of the time. This guy doesn't 3-bet or squeeze all that much, but I'd still be, this is 
a pretty good spot for him to squeeze. If he's ever going to squeeze light, it's going to be in this spot because it's button versus small blind. We both have really wide ranges. He folds loads to three bets. I fold a fair amount to three bets. So, so yeah, you got even though it's only five point six. If he is going to be squeezing, it's going to be at its lightest, like in a spot like this. <coughs> So, the reason I decided to turn this into a bluff and 3-bet it here, this is not a 3-bet for value, NSD Zhang folds 76% to 3-bet, so it's definitely not for value, it is as a bluff. So I'm trying to make him fold out hands like, you know, Ace-10, pocket pairs, even just all the random stuff he's opening, that's fine, because it's difficult to play a hand with only a minimal equity edge over his opening range out of position with no initiative. We can turn it into a bluff and we're happy to actually get folds from stuff like Queen 10 suited that have got good equity, like any Ace X, all these sort of hands. More than happy just to make him fold out all the crap in his range, as well as some hands that are actually doing really well against us. So, the other plus to electing the 3 bit bluff with a hand such as this is that it's got two pretty decent blockers to some of the hands that he'll 4 bet and get it in with, as well as some of the hands he's defending with like ace king king queen her discounted because we have the king jacks are discounted you know pocket kings discounted as well ace jack so some of these hands that dominate us although it does suck to be dominated by them when we block them they, they're not like super super likely when we get called here it's often going to be hands that we're doing okay against like you know pocket tens pocket jacks pocket queens um stuff like ace queen hands that we're not thrilled to be against but aren't like completely beating the shit out of us like ace king would be here or something so i think it's fine to go ahead and choose this hand to three bit bluff with i'd be three bit bluffing in this spot pretty wide against this guy and i think you guys like especially those of you playing who are a bit more competent playing 25 and l 50 and l should be looking at spots to to really pick on these regs that fold too much to three bits because if you aren't bluffing them with a reasonable frequency like for one, you're just letting them away with the fact that they're opening and playing fit or fold and multi-tabling and not fighting back. Okay, so you need to find out if they're fighting back or not, and if they're not, you just need to pound on them because it's free money right there. And secondly, if you never three bet bluff a guy like this, every time you pick up aces or kings and stuff, he's just gonna fold every time you three bet because your three bet number is gonna be like three percent on his HUD. So you want to exploit these guys who are just opening too wide and then not fighting back and you also want to give yourself an image that means that you can be seen as capable as uh, of actually bluffing so that he can defend lighter in the future okay so that's two reasons why it's good to have like a three bet bluffing range of some sort anyway I see a lot of guys that just never three bet bluff ever and it's just like passing up on free money you know look for spots for it watch videos where I 3 bit bluff where other instructors do it don't get carried away, don't do it if you don't understand it never do something if you don't understand why you're doing it but look for spots where this might be an option this sort of thing so we get good flop here, king 10-8 it's a board that he'll expect us to see bet a lot Um, if he has like jacks and queens and stuff like that he might 4 bet queens, he might not, we don't know if he has hands like even like 9s might peel once, if he's got 10x that'll peel once if he's got draws we get value from those this is a sort of hand where I do expect him to to have enough worse stuff in his range here that we can just see bet the flop quite comfortably. You know, he might even float like ace jack, ace queen, stuff like that here with a guard out he folds those, so easy bet on the flop. And and my sizing here, note I'm doing half pot here because the stack to pot ratio is such that I want to get it in, in three streets so as to not leave an awkward bet that would like screw me over for getting value or for setting up stack sizes to keep my range balanced between bluffs and value and stuff like that um, I want to I want to keep the pot such that it's consistent that I can just bet three streets and give them and just set up stacks to get it in over three streets so I'm not having to like over bet jam the turn or anything horrible like that that's gonna like mess up the EV of my plays basically so on the turn again I think we can bet here again the 10 won't be folding um, Queens and Jacks won't be folding, I wouldn't think. And there aren't that many better hands in his range. There's like King Queen, and then that's really. And then Pocket Tens, if he doesn't raise on the flop, maybe Pocket Eights, but whether he even defends Pocket Eights is debatable. 
when he's folding this much to 3 bets. So I think we're okay to go ahead and barrel here again. If he was really floaty and we thought he was going to bet this turn with like loads of ace jack ace queen combos, we could check call. But he does fold to 58% of C bet, so I'm not actually 100% sure he's floating those all the time. Although he may well be, it may be better to check call here because we get value from like queen jack, ace queen ace jack. Um, but it depends, it's kind of close spot. Check calling is probably not bad because you'll have those floats that have gut shots. If he didn't have any floats here and they didn't have gutters, that would be an incentive to float. Check calling would be bad. Um, but then again, like check calling allows queens and jacks to check back, but then again, we're not getting three streets from those anyway, probably, although we might be. Certainly, if the board bricks off, it's hard to say. He might this because we are quite aggro, or usually have quite an aggro image. You know, my aggression factor is usually fairly high. If a reg just glances at that and doesn't look at anything else, he may just decide to call me down lightly. It does happen, so. So we bet again. Again, it's consistent with setting up a shove for the river. Not messing myself up stack sizes wise. So we get a complete brick on the river, like the brick of all bricks. So the question is here can we shove for value? Right. If we don't shove for value, we're probably going to check fold here. Because, like, I don't think he double floats me ever with, like, ace jack or ace queen. This guy, I really don't think he's doing that. And he doesn't have that many heart combos, and if he does have hearts, he's going to raise them on the flop or turn a large amount of the time. So, really, there's no bluffs in his range here, or very few bluffs in his range, should we check. His most likely hands will be, like, king, queen, a random ace king that he didn't four bet with, or, like, a set. Or something like that. So, if we check, we're check folding. So the question is, do we shove or do we check fold? And that might sound weird. You might see check call as like the middle ground. It's not. It's a completely different situation, and it's playing against a completely different range. If we check call, we're thinking ourselves to have good equity against his betting range. If we shove, we're thinking ourselves to have good equity against his calling range. So it's completely different. So don't just check call because it's the middle ground and you're totally unsure what else to do. That's a terrible reason to check call. It's not a reason at all, in fact. It's a huge leak that happens all the time. So take these words to heart. You know, don't check call just for the sake of it in a spot like this because you will be fucking yourself over big time. More often than not, especially if the guy doesn't have air here and he doesn't really have much. Right, so I did a stove earlier of this, right? And this is the board, my hand, and his potential calling range, right? I sort of said, right, okay, let's say he's got ace-10 suited, because he defends the 3-bet with that. Jack-10 suited, um, and then, like, 10s, which is a set. He might not have all combos of 10s, but I gave him it anyway, because I've given him loads of combos of ace-10 suited, so that kind of balances out. He's got all king-queen, fair enough. And then, like, if he continues with jacks and queens as well. He might 4-bit queens, he might even 4-bit jacks, we can maybe even discount them a bit. But I think this range is like, given the how aggro I look and stuff, and the river being a brick, I think this range represents his likelihood of calling it off like fairly well. And we're like totally break even against this range, so shoving is never going to be a mistake in this sort of situation. If there's any chance that we, when we check fold, we are actually fold the best hand even 5% of the time, we should shove. And I hope you see why, because this is like a break even play basically shoving with 50% equity is getting is putting in the $60 and being entitled to 50% of the $120 pot i.e. your $60 back so it's completely break even if you don't think about rake but don't think about rake because that's just going to mess things up a little bit unnecessarily so it's basically the rake isn't going to be a big enough reason usually to do something whereas if we check fold here if he if we even have 15% equity versus river betting range, then we're just giving up that equity, whereas we're not by shoving with 50% equity. Same sort of thing, like imagine we had like 45% here, or 40%, it might still be better than check folding, but we can't check call because that's the worst of all. So often it can be better to actually just shove in a spot like this when it's really close, if you think there's any chance you're making any sort of mistake by check folding. And check folding might be correct once you check, it might not be a mistake after you've checked, because it's better than check calling, but 
if you can shove and get these all that get this range to put money in against you instead, this is going to be superior to sometimes folding out the best hand by check folding. See what I mean? So, so yeah. Given we've got like 50% here, if this range is accurate, you guys might disagree. Let me know if you do disagree with this range. If you think he's less likely to call down here with like 10x and stuff, I just feel like a guy like this is likely on this total brick of a river when all the draws brick to be stationary some percent of the time. It might not be this wide, but like I say, if we even have 40%, it might even still be better to jam it in. Just because it's our best option. If we could be like super sure that he didn't have bluffs by check folding, like ever, check folding might be better, but it's not the case that we're totally sure. We're never really sure of much in poker. We're like 100% sure that is. But it's the case that we think it's likely that he doesn't have many bluffs. Not that he doesn't have any at all. So this might be better to avoid having a check fold and surrender some equity we don't need to surrender. If we can bet for value profitably, like if we have like 20% equity here, then we should check fold because the amount of equity we give up by check folding the best hand 10% of the time is nothing compared to the amount we're spewing away by shoving with only 20% here. But with 50%, you know, we can go ahead and shove. So I hope that makes sense. Let me know if there's any questions about that bit of the analysis there. I realise some of these concepts I go into aren't like super simple, but there's a load of videos on here that talk about the ABC stuff, you know, you've got like micro videos, you've got other dudes who do videos that are not like more basic, but just that go into less sort of stuff that's likely to confuse people, but if you don't understand anything I say, don't go ahead and try and implement it, just ask or don't do it. But yeah, this explanation here isn't like the simplest thing in the world, but hopefully you can understand like I'm talking about how we're doing against two different ranges and just what's going to make the best expected value overall. So yeah, there is more to think about when you're betting than just the immediate EV of that option. You might need to wait against other options and realise that it's actually best. Don't try and do this crap at the table. You don't have time. Just practice and practice and study off the table. 50% of your time should be like study time, at least 40%. Like while you're just learning the game. You shouldn't, like when you're a solid grind at 100, 200 NL, fair enough, you know, study like 25% or whatever. Grind 75, but playing 10 NL, 25 NL, you know, you want to be studying like at least 40, 50% of the time. So you can practice all this stuff off the table and then you get more of a feel for it like on the table as well. No one expects you to be exact when you're actually playing, but you can get yourself used to used to doing this sort of thing to the point where you can get a vague idea and you just get slowly better and better at estimating making educated guesses as to what the best line is right let's move on to the next one that took quite a bit of time going through that so we'll speed up a bit now this is another three bit bluff here um, <clears throat> I assume when I made this I thought this guy was a reg or something and had less hands on him, or he was an unknown or something like that, and I just wanted to find out what the hell's going on. Versus an unknown you've never seen before, like, fair enough, if you think he's likely to be a reg, he'll give you respect here in fold, and you've got some blockers, your hand isn't terrible, and you certainly can't flat with it, so it's not a bad choice to turn into a bluff. But if this guy is in any way a fish like this, this is really terrible. Because, well it's not really terrible, it's just too weak, I'd rather have King Queen. Like this guy will continue super wide, yes he'll continue some worse hands, but he'll be continuing a shitload of better hands, like ace 10, king jack, king queen, ace king. And we might not have that much fold equity post flop against such a guy, we don't know. I mean I don't think it could be too bad since we have position and initiative against a weaker player who we can make fold on the flop sometimes, but I'd rather have a stronger hand, I probably wouldn't do this with king 10. If I saw his stats this way I'd probably do it with like king jack would be the worst hand. You know, you can isolate these guys with broadways that can flop top pair because they're just going to be weak. They're going to continue really wide pre-flop, so your top pair is actually going to be okay against them. But King-10, I think, is just, like, scraping the barrel a little bit too much. I think it's a bit weak. So I'd rather see a fold here. Um, he calls like he's going to do all day, but I, like I say, I assume I didn't have stats on him. I assume for these purposes that this guy is a regular because I don't think I would do this if he was just a fish like this. So assume that he's just like, we've only got like 10 hands on him or whatever. This obviously shows the amount of hands we have like overall, like now, not the amount we had at the time. I don't think there's a way to actually see that here. No, there's not. So on this flop, um, a guy like this is still going to have plenty of hands that have missed here. It looks like a really scary board and it is to some extent, but bear in mind a 43-26 tends to limp 
hands like seven eight nine seven nine eight ten nine seven six all these hands that we usually worried about someone continuing with on a board like this in a two bit pot he doesn't actually open that often because he's got a gap between the VPIP and his PFR so he's probably limping those a lot so the main hands we're worried about here is like maybe stuff like ace nine maybe um sets obviously pocket tens pocket jacks um stuff like that but and some draws that won't fold obviously as well but in general there'll be enough like ace king ace queen ace jack um you know like king jack king queen loads of broadway combos here that are going to have to fold to c bet so if we give ourselves a really good price like we do here we don't need to bet much here remember when you're c betting to fold out a really weak range you don't need to bet much to accomplish that because he's not going to float here with ace queen on this board i wouldn't think unless he's just a huge station so we don't need to bet like 17 to fold out ace queen don't spew extra money you know all we have is like an open ender and an over and two over cards right we're not like betting for value here so don't spew extra money against his continuing range because his continuing range has you beat quite considerably and the range you're trying to fold out will still fold out for a small bet okay so that's why we make a small c bet here think about the sizing it's not just random it's actually there's thought going into it there's always thought going into like bet sizing what you're trying to accomplish basically on the turn we make top pair if we bet here we're basically turning our hand into a bluff he has plenty of jacks in his range because he has a gut shot and he doesn't want to fold and run the flop um he can have like queen jack king jack ace jack he can maybe even the odd like jack nine suited sometimes stuff like that and sometimes he can have a flush and he can still have sets and he probably won't call with any worse hands now we're folding out all the overcards in the flop he doesn't have a whole lot of one pair hands here he has like maybe a few two pair a bunch of sets a bunch of straights and flushes so really we're just checking back here trying to get the showdown but not expecting to have the best hand very often at all um if he puts any more money into the pot we're obviously going to fold we can't bluff catch here because again what possible air does he have here none he's going to fold ace queen on the flop now he has even less you know he has no air here at all if he bets he has like a jack all the time or a flush or maybe a set but he probably checks it because he's a pussy he doesn't know how to value bet because fish just can't value bet because they're retarded at it so we're like happy now we fired our plus EVC bet you know our pre-flop play was kind of dodgy but you know it's not the end of the world and it could be I think it's the case that we didn't have this many hands on the guy at times he's probably more of an unknown but um on this river we're just folding now if he bets or we're checking back trying to get the showdown bets 22 that for a fish can be anything that can be like a value bet size that can be a bluff size but in a spot where there's no bluffs in his range it's just always value so we can't beat any of that so we just fold our weak pair pretty standard oops i'll just jump back and see what happened there all right so we're blind versus blind here aurora is a player who opens really wide in a small blind I think, well 29%, fairly wide, it's mainly the button he opens wide in, but that's still really wide, that's easily wide enough that when we have position, a hand like King-10 has a big enough equity edge, remember the three things that govern whether you want to defend, your equity, position, initiative, so we don't have initiative, but that's okay because we have position and a good equity edge here, so that's outweighed, so balance those three things up in the scales in your head and sort of try and determine whether you have enough of the good aspects of those and little enough of the bad aspects of those to defend here I think it's fine okay so if we are defending a hand like King-10 here against a guy who opens really wide and see-bets 90% and then we're folding this board we're probably leaking money somewhere because he's just gonna have such a weak range here that I'm just gonna float and, and just give him hell like later on I'm gonna use my position I'm gonna float um, expect him to give up on some turns but we can mess with him you know we can raise turns where we pick up some equity you know like jacks or queens and stuff like that um we pick up like a gutter um and we can also like expect him to barrel like tens and kings which is great for us because we obviously have a really disguised strong top pair hand and he's just gonna spew into us in those situations so i definitely think this is a good spot to float we've got some backdoor draws we've got okay equity against his range actually and his range is weak so we're going to be able to take it down on a later street a decent amount of time when we have position here and we're getting a good price on our float so 
we go ahead and float here. If we raise, we don't really rep anything. We open ourselves up to being 3-bit bluffed by this guy. When we've got king high, we can't really do much about that. Um, I don't like raising here for that reason. If he was really straightforward, multi-tabling guy that wasn't going to mess with us, we could raise. But I much prefer float here. It's far more consistent with our game plan. We're going to be flat in like pocket fives on this flop. We're going to be flat in like quads and 9x. So I don't see the point in raising here. We just rep nothing. We're likely to get fucked with. And he won't even fold like ace jack to us and stuff like that. So... And if we have that read, obviously, maybe we should be raising like a 9 here for value and stuff like that, just because it'll, it'll mess with them. But then we want them to barrel into us, so it is a double-sorted double sort of thing. There's reasons against raising, there's reasons for it if we had a value hand here, but without one, I'd definitely rather just flat. Um, we get a dream turn card, flop top pair. We've got the best hand here a huge amount of the time. Um, he'll barrel this with all his air, so we've got huge equity against his turn barreling range here. So we're just going to call again and call any river because we're like right at the top of our range and we're really disguised. He thinks there's like no kings in our range. Well, very few. The only kings in our range are random ones that floated the flop and he probably won't expect that too often. So he thinks our range here is like pocket sixes and all that kind of crap. 5x, you know, ace five, pocket fours, ace high. So he is going to barrel the living hell out of us with like anything that doesn't have showdown value here. We know this because he's a reg, he's obviously thinking a bit about a range, you know. He knows it's weak, he's going to bet, we're going to call. Standard game plan. We know what's going to happen before it happens, this is the thing. We want to have a game plan at all times. We want to know what he's going to do, we want to react to it. Bet's 14, kind of standard size, we call. We expect him to bet the river. If he does, we'll snap, he checks. Now, we have the best hand absolutely 100% of the time here, I would think, unless we get check raised. I don't think he's going to check raise this river. Again, our range looks too much like it's pocket eights and stuff like that. If he wants value in this river, he's probably going to bet. Because why would we bet? We don't have anything we can bet except for like really strong hands like boats and stuff. So I think, I think this is going to be a very easy value bet because we just have the best hand all the time. And he can easily have something like queens here. He can easily have like eights. I don't see why he wouldn't barrel a hand like 8s in the turn, he should be barreling 8s in the turn because we never have a king and we expect him to barrel the turn loads and we might not fold ace higher up here. So I do think he can have a load of bluff catchers here and not realise that we don't have much air, I don't know why he would actually call but if he can hand read but you know we have to bet anyway because we have the best hand so often and just you know sort of throw our hands in the air and just say hey please call us you know, that's all we can do. Bet 26 and pretty easy fold for him with like most of his range here that he checks the river with. I don't see why he would check a better hand there ever. So, okay, I think this is the final one. Yeah, so we get raised by a dude who opens like 21% small blind. Again, King Jack has position and enough equity to defend with. We don't want to turn it into a bluff and start 3 bet with it. The guy doesn't fold that much. We're not going to be able to do it for value. It's a total waste of the hand to use it up as a bluff and get four rep bluffed off of it, or get like, or make him defend a range that actually does well against us. So we want to keep his range wide while he's opening like 25% or whatever. Leave all those worst dominated hands in his range and just defend with the king jack here with our position and our equity edge. Lovely flop for us. Okay. So just remember in that last hand I said. On a really dry board like this, a reg is not going to expect us to raise stuff for value. He's going to expect us to flat sets here. Um, no one ever expects you to raise top here in a spot like this because regs are like so generic, they're used to playing against each other. And you know what the truth is? The honest truth is that 90% of regs suck. If you look them up on any like tracking software, you see their results or you know, you they suck. They're like very marginal winners who grind out a shitload of rate back, or they're like losing players who break even after rate back. That is like the case with so, so many regulars, right? So, they're used to playing against other regs who are also bad and also incapable of thinking outside the box. What makes a really good reg is someone who's actually capable of adjusting, like, every day day in, day out adjustment to his opponents, always being a step ahead and doing what they don't expect him to do. This is a spot where no other regs, or like 90% of other regs against this running solo guy will not raise jack x on this flop. Running solo is conditioned to think that if someone raises this flop against them, 
they are full of shit a huge amount of the time and they have like four or five suited or they have like seven five suited or they have like ace high or something because they don't expect it and they don't even expect you to raise a set and you only have like very few combos of sets so he's not going to give me any credit here when I raise against a guy that was capable of working out that I'm not bluffing when I raise here I wouldn't do it, I'd just call because it's a lovely spot to call and let him barrel, you've got so much equity use your position, it's a dream spot but against a guy that I know is quite spewy, this guy is spewy, like I battle with him a lot and he's just bad, he's a losing player um, against this guy like I just think he's not going to give me any credit when I raise here I think he's going to spew, I think he's going to just be on really sort of level 2 sort of reg, 100 NL reg thought and he's not going to be able to get himself out of that box of me being full of shit here so that's why I decided to take this flop line and he 3 bets me and when he does this it's like wow you're incredibly full of shit all the time because like why would he even do this with a set you wouldn't expect me to raise jack x why would he do this with a set he would call with a set and bluff catch because my range looks full of shit to him so when he does this this is just like absolute proof that he has nothing almost guaranteed sure sometimes he'll show up with a set that he's just playing badly or something like that but that's like so few combos of his range six combos of sets and he plays a set like this maybe a fifth of the time so that's like one or two combos of better hands here and then the rest is going to be air he's not going to do this with like a jack maybe I don't, I don't think he'd do this with ace jack he'd just bluff catch with ace jack like all the time so this is like four or five suited or something he's either got some sort of a draw or he's got air so I'm just going to flat here and I'm going to let him like shovel it in, in the turn if he wants to keep spewing at me pot's going to be big enough for him to shovel the turn I'm going to call and let him do that I'm not going to shove here because if I shove I'm turning my hand into a bluff because he doesn't have any worse value hands in his range but he does have lots and lots of air because I've induced the air to put more money into the pot because I know he's bad and I know he can't escape from thinking that I have air when I raise okay so this is like a leveling blind versus blind war versus a bad reg and how to exploit a bad reg and to capitalize on their stupid inbuilt tendencies that they can't shake themselves off of B flat 70 bucks in the pot now pot size shove left he checks the turn almost want to just bet for protection here I bet like twenty dollars or something or I'll bet like twelve dollars or something weird like that and see if he wants to like go ahead and maybe not twelve maybe bet something that could potentially be a bluff like fifteen sixteen and see if I can get him to jam like overs at me or turn flush draw at me if he's turned a flush draw he'll probably jam that um, four five has actually just made a straight which kind of sucks because that's like some of his hands so if I bet call here I'd have to assume that he's capable of like re-jamming like total air which is possible because you spew but again like it looks like I can't have air now when I float flat this flop I'd have to be insane in his eyes to to flat his 3 bet with air although if I had raised this flop with air I probably would flat his 3 bet with air and then take it away in the turn because he's so full of shit that's exactly what I would do but he won't expect that um, but that's why I wouldn't even raise this flop with air in the first place because it's just I'm just not getting folds from him. anyway so I decide to check back the turn I think it's okay it's kind of standard now he checks the river again like again I don't have air in my range so I don't think I can even get called by this bastard I can't even get called by him like he doesn't have worse jacks here like ever if he has any sort of hand here that's better than me it's going to be like a random 3x that he turned into a bluff on the flop or it's going to be like a random flush he's backdoored into or ace jack that he randomly played like this once every blue moon he might do that so really there's no worse hand that can call me here so I'm just gonna check again I could bet like nine dollars and get like looked up by ace high or something just out of curiosity I don't hate that but then if I'm unsure whether he's gonna shove as a bluff or not it's a bit messy um, if I thought he was really sort of really stupid and crazy and drunk or on tilt or something I'd bet like eleven dollars here and just let him shove and just call or do that on the turn but I think he's semi-competent, he's not competent, but he's semi-competent enough to realise that I don't have any air in my range when I flat the flop. Even though that's not necessarily true, um, that's what I'll assume. So I don't think I can I can bet this river at all. Even though we have the best hand, like 90% of the time, easily, 
there's just no worse hands that are calling here so even if we have the best hand 90% of the time we might only have like hardly any equity versus his actual calling range on the river so again two different ranges to think about so we check back he has ace king okay let's talk about how disgusting his play is right again running solo if you're watching this somehow I apologize I don't mean it personally and you might learn something from this but it's just really really bad like on the flop okay you see about that flop fine whatever and I raise okay you have the nut bluff catcher you have the nut bluff catcher because not only do you have the nut ace high but you have like more equity than if you had like ace three because there's more outs for you to hit to improve to the best hand or to make a hand that's like if I'm raising a jack here that's going to have the best hand so given that you have the nut bluff catcher if you think I'm really full of shit on the flop and let's assume that you do think that and it's okay to think that even though I don't think it is okay to assume that but if it is okay to assume that then you should just call with your ace king because I'm going to barrel aces and kings and you're going to have like the nuts and you're going to have the best hand you're ahead of all my bluffs basically assuming I'm not turning like a six into a bluff which I don't think I am ever on this board so you're actually just going to have the best hand like all the time if I'm bluffing so why the hell are you turning it into a bluff in three bet don't understand yeah. Alright, I've been going for it, I think, quite a while, so we'll round up there. I think that's an instructive hand, though, like when you get to 100 NL and regs are like, and you know a guy's bad. Obviously, I take a note on this as soon as I do this, and I know that he does this in future. He plays so many hands, he won't remember this hand. He probably doesn't take notes because he's like 18 tabling. Of course, he's like 18 tabling, he's like 15, 14, for God's sakes. So I'll just do this to him again, and he won't be any the wiser in the future, and that's how you exploit bad regs, and that's how you make sure you don't become one of these break even rake back guys that's how you set yourself above from the crowd is by adjusting your game and exploiting them exploit the shit out of them alright I hope you've enjoyed this trouble hand series I've certainly enjoyed making it it's been fun and I think it's been informative main thing about King Jack just avoid think about that formula I used pre-flop you want to think about it's not an exact science but it's like initiative plus fav favorable initiative plus favorable position plus equity edge equals happy days the negatives of those equals sad days and you should fold all right so yeah i'm excited about the next series also i'll just remind you guys again send me pms and emails first three who send me an email or a pm expressing that they are going to send me a video and I'm going to take your word for it they are going to actually make me a video so don't send me this if you're busy and you're not going to have time to do it only send me a PM if you have time to make this video and I will go ahead and use it in my next series which will be member reviews and plugin leaks that are actually from you guys the sessions of you guys so yep it's been a pleasure making trouble hands if you haven't if you missed any of the episodes go back and watch them I think they're all pretty decent and I'll, I'll have a good Christmas have a good new year and I'll see you guys on the next series for sure alright peace